What is happening, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Off the Rails. My name is Mark, and with me always is Dave. And uh, as you know, Off the Rails is a recovery podcast dedicated to ending the stigma of addiction through open discussion on all things recovery related. And uh, today we got a very, very special guest. Yeah. Dave. Yeah, we got a great guest today. Episode numero quatre. That's four. Uh, we got Matt. Gardner, and uh, yeah, real stoked about this one. Matt is uh, an incredible guest. He is an author of a book called The Recovery Roadmap. He has his own podcast called Beyond Recovery, and you can find him on Instagram at recoveryroadmap.me. So check him out. Great dude. Yeah, I'm excited. Also, uh, episode four of this season, and it's our first guests we're having on in this season that is uh, also in recovery our first three guests were kind of more experts in their fields they were speaking of but weren't necessarily in recovery um so looking forward to diving into this combo with uh with matt with a fellow person recovery, in recovery 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 Matt is also a recovery coach and this episode touches on uh, a lot of that touches on owning your sobriety and uh, we get in some other cool shit. So, Dave, should we take it away here? I That's hope you guys cool. enjoy it. All right. Now we got here on the show with us, recovery coach, sobriety coach, Matt Gardner. Matt, welcome uh, welcome to the show, man. Yeah, thanks, guys. Thanks for having me on. I've been uh, been looking forward to this one. And then, you know, just a little preamble we had, you know, a couple, a couple of other Canadian fellows. Always good to meet you guys, you know. Yeah, yeah Matt, thanks so much for joining us. Um, yeah. We really appreciate it. And uh, I'm really looking forward to getting into this conversation. Um, I think your background is going to be very helpful for anyone listening. And, um, you know, we kind of had that discussion where one thing three of us have in common, I mean, amongst other things, is that we all are very, we're open about our sobriety and our recovery. And how has that kind of helped you in your recovery being open with it and sharing your story and at what point were you kind of uh i guess like what point did you decide that you wanted to share with others your struggles and you know your recovery yeah yeah that's a great opening question you know for me so i a little backstory just to give context like i had worked um the same job for 23 years. I got hired when I was 16 years old. Started as you know the the, the punk closing the bakery down, you know, five nights a week. And when I'm working through high school, it was supposed to be uh, in my mind, it was a transitional job for me. And I just kind of kept going with it, right? Until I was assistant store manager. And I'll tell you, like when I was in that setting, uh, I was very secretive and very protective over who I told uh, you know, about like just my my drinking and and then about my recovery as well and you know, that ended up shooting me in the foot because i you know there was a part of me that wasn't i was just being a little too ambiguous about it to myself right and that's what led me to relapsing actually so fast forward to um i'd say i've been doing the coaching for about 14 months now and what i did is actually i just i finally uh quit the previous job and it was pretty much like right then and there is when I'm like, you know what, I'm just going to be completely honest about it. It felt very freeing. It was like, okay, this is the time that I can, you know, start saying, you know, my story and not be super worried about like, you know, going into work the next day and having people, you know, you know, doing the whisper stuff or, you know, that was my perception of it. Who knows how much that would have actually happened, but it was enough to, you know, to make me be secretive about it, if you know what I mean. So it was a very freeing experience for me to be able to just step out of that and um yeah that that's helped help me big time and uh, honestly there's from that the unexpected uh benefits have been my strength and my ability to help others right so like because i was sort of that ambiguous sort of on the fence who i was telling and you know being how open i was being um i was not fully able to be present and being able to help other people so now that i'm st- fully engaged on the other side of the fence so to speak and being open about my own story I've, I've felt that I could be that for somebody else, right. That's still kind of wavering about it as well and help them work, work through it. And as I'm sure you guys both know is, is, you know, a big part of, of recovery is 
is uh, it's kind of like that hero's journey thing. I don't know if you've seen like Joseph Campbell thing where it's just like, um, you know, you, you, you cross the threshold, you do all this inner work, the, the dark night of the soul, so to speak. And then you come out the other side with this like newfound uh, version of yourself. And what is, I think it's human nature to want to go back and share that with somebody, you know what I mean? And go back and help. And it's such a big part of the recovery. So, you know, that's uh, yeah, that was, that was big for me, man. It's like to be able to do that, it was a whole nother level of accountability I put on myself and then the ability to then help others, uh, you know, that, that after I was fully engaged in my own story. So, so early on, um, you know, how was it received with your, your close friends and uh, your family when you, you know, shared with them um, the struggles you were dealing with um, early on? Yeah, that's an important question too. And I'll tell you why, like, this is, this is my, experience with it and i've had a lot of people that that i've you know either helped or just held space for that have had the same issue where i had this idea that i was going to be viewed as this massive failure and like disowned you know and and fired from my job and uh, i've let everybody down right and that was one of the things that facilitated or that you know um it was one of those stories that continued my to feed into my my drinking right initially is like well i can't like i can't just ask for help like every the house of cards will come down if i do that though my life is over right uh and it was like the exact opposite man like so i went to work uh this was like my first time i sober up it was 2012 i had three years and i relapsed and then now I'm, I'm working on four years now i'm coming up on it in a couple of weeks actually uh but back in 2012 uh that was like my my lowest moment and um i just remember you know, I, I was like, I have to put my hand up here and I, I, I can't just keep going on like this. Right. And, uh, my, my boss at the time was, uh, you know, the typical like alpha male, you know, uh, just like work hard, like fairly stoic, you know what I mean? He's, he, he cracks some jokes and such too, but, but basically just like, you know, this is, it is what it is. Very like binary type relationship with them. I'm like, this guy's going to think I'm such a pansy. Like I, you know, oh, I need help. Right. And it was like, to it was totally the opposite. He was so compassionate and understanding and he really helped me navigate it. And to this day, you know, like that him being able to do that for me, like is the reason I'm having this conversation with you guys. Right. So, uh, and then with my parents, um, my dad was a big, like we were drinking buddies essentially. Right. So there was a degree of, uh, like he was, a he's, he was a, say, cause he passed away, which is a big part of my story too, which we may or may not get into, um, you know, he was, uh, yeah, he was proud of me because I think secretly he knew like he had a problem. He was, he was in denial about it, but I think there was a part of them that knew that he had a problem and that I was going down that same road. So he was proud of me in that sense, but he'd also take a few shots and just like, you know, that like drunk humor, right. After you'd have a couple of beers, he's like, Oh man, I kind of miss having, you know, having a few drinks with my son and, you know, so that sort of thing. Uh, but other than that, like my mom and my brother are incredibly supportive as well. And it was really, honestly, was to to summarize, it was like the opposite of what I thought was going to happen. I thought I was just going to be like, ah, you know, you've been disowned, you've been fired and all that. It was completely the opposite. Yeah, I, I really relate to that. I remember just thinking like, what is everyone going to think of me? But I think the amount of support from from friends and family and even even people I've never met before has been been incredible. Hey, yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. And it's so, it's such a, a rewarding feeling too. Right. And it's uh it's, it's a big motivator. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, it really, it, it, you know, we talk about like, I don't know how it, it, this will reach every listener as far as like the spirituality, but like it really, that's when I started to kind of bloom and, and find myself on a more spiritual level. And that sort of allowed me to get into that, you know, the rooms of recovery and start experimenting with that side of me was was from that the genesis was from uh you know my friend's family boss and that sort of thing matt so you mentioned like um i guess being able to help people and getting more in touch with spirituality um has there been any other benefits for you in being so open with your recovery yeah for sure i mean those are the, those are the big things you know i just i feel like a i i felt like such a like a fragmented person before you know, and this, this is how it, so it shows up in my business as well, right? Where before I would have all these like peripheral projects, I felt like I had to have a bunch of different projects on the go. I was in three bands, you know, I, I, I didn't, 
I felt like there was this need to have a bunch of like satellite different things. And that was, that was my identity. Cause I didn't, I don't think I truly knew myself, you know, I was still figuring things out. Right. And now with my sobriety where it is and my, you know, stepping into my stepping out of the shadow and into my, my actual story and being able to help others with it. Uh, it just feels like everything has really come together and it's moving like energetically it's moving in, in one direction, as opposed to this fragmented person that was before where I'd be like, almost like a persona of protection, depending on who I was talking to. You'd have like work, Matt, you would have music, musician, Matt, you'd have drinker, Matt, you'd have a uh, family, Matt. Right. And now I just feel so much more whole and so much more unified. Uh, and you know, and that's, I mean, it, it's still working on it, right. There's still, um, patterns that I have of my past, you know, 20 plus years of, of being, whether it's in high school into like the, the, you know, working a job for 20 years, that's a lot of ingrained patterns and learning how to like read people and navigate different personalities and such. Right. So that's, that's still there. Uh, but yeah, it's just that, that would be the number one thing for sure. And it shows up in my business. It shows up in my relationships, just a, a feeling much more um, feeling of like whole and, and unity. So you said you've been doing the recovery coaching for 14 months. Yeah. 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 Can, can we get into a little bit? I mean, I, I would imagine a lot of people that are, are listening would know kind of an idea of what recovery coach looks like, but can we get into maybe a little bit of, um, all like a general synopsis of uh, what it looks like with you and what you try to provide for, for people you're helping with, uh, with recovery. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, the way I look at recovery, I'd be interested to, um, you know, riff on that with you guys a little bit about this is like, you know, so the difference between 2012 and now, like when I first sobered up the first time, it was very much uh, AA. And that was like a huge part of this AA saved my life. Right. Um, you know, I, I reached a stage though, where it was like, I was starting to desire more. There was something else that was different elements that were missing, you know? Um, and, uh, so that's where I'm kind of viewing, you know, recovery and sobriety is, uh, in 2023, right. Is like, it's, you know, there's many different elements that people can use now. It's, it's, it's kind of like working out, right? Like it's, uh, if you go to the gym, there's people doing CrossFit, there's people doing like heavy cardio, there's all these different modalities of working out now. And I view that at the same with recovery. Yes. There's going to be some broad strokes as far as like, you know, uh, things that are going to be effective with everybody. Um, you know, whether it's like timelines or group coaching or just connection, like they say, our opposite of addiction is connection, right? Making sure that you're connected with folks, a sponsor or a coach or like that, that one-on-one -on -one will always be there is very important. Right. But everything else I, I think is, um, is quite customizable, right. Just as like a workout program is. So that's why that's my approach with, with the recovery roadmap, which is the, um, the recovery groups that we do. I just did a, uh, a group that we started as sober October and we just kept going and, and it was really cool. It was, a, I had a few newcomers come and go, but there's the core group. I ended up doing uh five months worth of coaching with, and we crossed across um, a couple, a couple of the members had their sober dates. So we had the sober birthdays and everything it was really cool. Right. So basically to answer your question, um, we do like group coaching. So we were doing like a one uh, once a week, uh, like group uh, with a, just a, a couple topics and just go around the horn. Okay. Uh, whether it's early recovery, whether it's just something that's coming up for you right now. Uh, we do, I, I do something called story work coaching, which is amazing. Uh, I'd love to get into that. I'll give a little you know, Cole's notes version of that. Uh, if, if we can, uh, we do Sunday events. So the Sunday events is getting into the more uh, like connecting with your body, sort of breath work, uh, yoga, some kind of movement practice. Right. So, and that's a Sunday morning thing. Um, you know, and then we have a, a private Facebook community where you're encouraged to do a daily check-in and that would just be like, you know, you pick up your phone. It's like, you drop into like, okay, your emotion. A lot of times we, when I say, if I ask, if somebody asks me how I was doing back in the day, I would launch into a story. Right. And it's like, you can infer from my story how I'm doing, but it's like a lot of times we just sort of bypass what we're actually feeling. And people are not as coordinated with talking about their emotions because it's just like all about the, Oh, I got cut off in traffic and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, okay, you're angry. Right. But it's like, people are, I, I find that uh, it's, 
you know, the further along you get into your adulthood, it's, it's, it's easier to um, lose coordination with your own emotions and the way that you're feeling uh, like doing a body scan, for example, right. We're living from our heads up, you know what I mean? So uh, that's what the, the, uh, the check-in is encouraged to do. Just get in there and be like, Hey, this is how I'm feeling today. Body scan wise. I feel a little bit tight in my lower back. Uh, you know, and yeah, we just have a, a few other different things along the way. We call it like uh, the morning routine. So it's the 30 thrive 30. You pick a body, mind, spirit exercise. So 10 minutes per topic. Uh, you do that for the 30 days if we're doing a 30 day challenge. So f- for example, like for me, uh, body would be, I go for a 10 minute jog mind. I read out loud for 10 minutes and spirit. I do 10 minutes of journaling. Right. And you just commit to that, these small habits, small victories throughout that 30 day process. Right. And it really adds up. So it's just really an immersive, uh, program, but it's, it's still flexible. Right. I mean, it sounds, as I'm telling you guys, it sounds like a lot, but as soon as you get into it, it's, uh, it's great. And it's just, it's amazing to see the group really come together over a period of time and and just the the way that you know we were talking about before like persona and ego just there's no need for it and you can have these you know vulnerable shares and everybody just genuinely in there to support each other you know um yeah so that's that's uh the program from like a you know the ten thousand foot view if you will Matt, just to take it back, like uh, to one step here. Um, yeah. What kind of motivate you to get involved in recovery coaching? And um, yeah. yeah, did you have a recovery coach yourself? And you're like, you know what, I could do this. Or what kind of made you decide that? For sure. Yeah, great question. So yeah, the origin of that is, uh, you know, I was, I was at the stage where I was getting quite disenchanted with my previous job. So I ended up taking a six month leave of absence. I just, I thought something was wrong. Well, something was wrong with me, but you know, I, by this time I was two, two years sober and there was something that was just, I was noticing like, but when I was on my way to work, I just feel this dread, like beyond anxiety. Like I'm like, I'm not supposed to be doing this anymore. So I ended up just taking uh, six months off under the guys that like, you know what, I think I'm just burnt out. I'm just going to take some time and do some stuff that I've been wanting to do music wise or whatever. And uh, morning one of waking up from that, you know, every now, I don't know if you guys get this, but every now and then I have this like voice in my head that's beyond my normal inner dialogue. And the voice said, you're not going back. I was like, hmm, interesting. That's I was always considering going back. I did end up going back for a few months, but I was like, interesting. So, you know, a couple, fast forward a couple months into that leave of absence, um, I was just like, what, what can I do? Like, what are my strengths, yada, yada. And what I realized is I really loved, you know, having the level of experience that I did, uh, you know, there's a lot of people that were coming up and getting into positions that had had a couple of years experience, but I had like 23 years. So there was a, a opportunity a lot of times to help coach and mentor people in my role. And I love that aspect of it. So I'm like, okay, I love the coaching part. Uh, And then, so what's my life experience? What can I uh, bring in that I have experientially, you know, uh, you know, a a wealth of, yeah, I guess this life experience with, and that would be the, you know, drinking and recovering from drinking and everything else. Right. So just uh, the natural fit for me is to combine them. Now, as far as uh, did I have a coach? So a little bit of background on that. I've tried uh, you know, I've, I've had, I haven't tried, I had therapy, uh, you know, counseling and such for 10 years on and off for various things, the addiction, uh, my alcoholism and, uh, you know, relationship stuff. And when I got into the coaching certification that I took, which is in lifted it's, and when that's the story work method that I've been, uh, alluding to, it just honestly, dude, it blew everything out of the water. Like I was, it was game changing. So, uh, the idea with story work is like, you have, um, you know, stories from your past. Every we all have stories, right? It's like uh, uh, the meaning that we give stories is sort of dictates a lot. So the the two phrases I always say is like, change your story, change your life. Uh, there's also a stoic quote. I'm going to paraphrase it, but it's like, it's not your life circumstances that get you. It's your story about your life circumstances that get you, right? So this idea that a lot of times the stories that we tell ourselves and others, there's like embellishments whether it's to protect us or to like, there's some egoic need to like brag, whatever it may be. There's a lot of like distorted facts in our stories. Right. So, and they can also, um, you know, there can be stories that are like hurt you or haunt you that still have all this shame and stuff, especially when you're talking about addictions, 
And, uh, you know, and, and my, my alcoholism was just, there was a ton of uh, drinking alone. There was a ton of secretive, uh, you know, behavior um, and a lot of shame that came out of that. Right. So uh, as soon as we got into that aspect, my head coach of Inlifted, his name is Mark England. And he started, obviously for me to learn it, I had to be the test subject. Right. So he's showing me how to do it, but I'm also going through the process. So I'm doing the story work of my own, uh, you know, my own stories of my life. And, you know, the majority of the stories that haunt me and there's still about a, sh although there was still a lot of shame attached to them were quite frankly, my drinking stories. So uh, that's where I had that light bulb moment where I'm like, holy crap, there's a lot of this stuff that I've been carrying around, you know, the phrase, uh, the body remembers what the the mind forgets. There was a lot of that shame and that like tense stuff. Like when I start talking about it, I got really contracted. Right. And so, yeah, as soon as we, uh, we aired, I'd say a good five or six of those out as part of my certification, uh, I realized how powerful it was, right? So they say, you know, the story work process is like, if you go to therapy, therapy is like letting off some steam, right? Whereas like the story work coaching, the idea is it goes right for the flame. Like you go for the source, you're going to turn that, that flame right off. So um, that was like my, essentially my origin uh, as far as like getting into recovery coaching and why, and yes, I do have uh, several coaches that I continue to use. I, I, to me, coaching is like it tops any other modality and it's not, I'm not saying that, you know, that, uh, there's no room for therapists or anything like that by any means. I don't want to start like some, uh, some <laughs> shit here, but, uh, for me personally, I just, I find that to be head and shoulders above, above anything else. That's my personal experience. So you kind of already touched on, uh, on the next question I got for you here, but, um, you know, adding, you know, different elements to, for your physical, mental, uh, spiritual health, in addition to, you know, say your AA, NA, whatever, whatever else you're kind of doing for your recovery. Um, how important is that? And do you think, um, you know, I mean, you already mentioned that was a big thing for you kind of early on to kind of seeking, seeking more. Um, is it hard to, for yourself as a recovery coach, when you have people at different stages, perhaps to kind of, um, find a good a good balance between between all of it or uh because everyone's different right so how do you, how does that approach uh for you with your with your people you have yeah no that's a you know that's a really great question and yeah it is it's so different from person to person right and it's it's all about like for coaching for me it's like meeting people where they are so it's up to me to be as curious as i possibly can be and really investigate uh where the people are uh, initially and, um, and find out where co their comfort levels are. Cause there's some people that like literally haven't done yoga or breath work, actually quite a few people, uh, you know, and even journaling is like painful for some people, right? Like e anything to do with like mental health is, um, you know, it's, it's a lot more normalized nowadays, but it's still kind of, you know what I mean? It's a little more taboo than it, you know, than it, could be, well, you know, uh, so yeah, it's, 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 uh, a matter of, having that in mind, like, so when somebody's going to be coached by me, that's something that we're going to talk about right away is like, where are you? We're going to find, and you said the magic word there balance. Like, where are you on body, mind, spirit? And, you know, there's some people that are having a hard time finding what they can call a spiritual side. Right. Um, and then, so we're going to do a little bit of work on that. And that's where the story work comes in too. It's like, is there an origin of perhaps your parents were overbearing on one side of religion and you have this like collapsed distinction that religion is spirituality when in fact, okay, well, let's separate those. You can still be spiritual and you don't necessarily have to believe in organized religion if that's what's really, you know what I mean? So there's many different ways to investigate it, but the whole idea is like, and you said, like I said, you, you mentioned the magic word of balance and you want to find the, you don't want to have too much mental side of things. You know, like I've, I've done this before where it's like you'd binge on podcasts and it's like, you're just, you're, you're taking it all, all this input in, uh, but there's no action. There's no body behind it to like in, help integrate it. And actually like, you know, they say knowledge is power, but knowledge is only power if you integrate it or if you have a chance to bring it into your life. And otherwise it's just kind of like another form of procrastination in a lot of ways, isn't it? So it's, um, yeah, it's, it's finding the balance and that I, I find that from just asking questions, figuring out comfortability and, you know, that's why that, like that, the, the 10 minutes a day thing is so important because it doesn't have to be this epic 
change right off the bat, right? If you're not comfortable, if somebody has a sedentary lifestyle and I'm talking, yeah, we're going to get in great shape and all that, like it's going to scare people off too. So it's just like 10 minutes a day of like, you know, like body weight exercise is like, you know, it's going to be uh, somebody that's doesn't exercise very much is going to have, a, that's going to be a lot more palatable to them. Right. So then you can start having these micro wins that honestly, if you like at 10 minutes a day for something, that'll be 61 hours by the end of the year. Right. It's like 1% of your day. Right. And it's, 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 and that's where you start making uh, some lasting changes in habits. And it's just, you know, it's, it's like that 1% a day and it just really adds up over time. So that would be my approach with it is uh, uh, under the guise of finding balance and, uh, and doing it just with these micro habits and finding a comfortability level. So it's, um, you're not, you're not yeah, focusing so much on like the motivation aspect. It's so easy. It's so simple that even when you're not motivated, you're going to continue on with it. Sure. Awesome. Matt, um, earlier you, you touched on, um, inner dialogue mm. and, um, I think a lot of times inactive addiction, the negative self-talk is just, it just really gets overwhelming and it's probably something you got to work on a lot with your clients, I would imagine. So, uh, what are some kind of tools to combat that negative self-talk that, that, uh, that I'm getting at here? Yeah. It's, yeah. Yeah. This is like, we could do a whole episode on this, but I'll just, <laughs> I'll give some basics. Yeah, dude, that's like, it's such a big thing, right? So awareness is the key for everything, right? So, uh, just being aware of how you're thinking is like a huge win. If you can just, just let it happen, but be aware of it. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that's step one. Uh, actually I'm going to say step zero is like it, tune into like how you're breathing too. Right. So this was a huge one for me and it's so important. I view breathing as, you know, as same thing as like my heart beating, right? It wasn't anything I really paid attention to. It's just something I did. Uh, and then it was pointed out to me, and this is a big part of the enlifted method as well, is low and slow abdomen breathing. And what that does is like, I think it's like something like 80 or 85% of adults chest breathe. And they don't not really exactly sure as to why. I think it's just like we have this mild stress response throughout the day, whether it's from parenting, from our jobs, right? And it's just like that is like keeps you in that sympathetic um, state where it's just like you're doing this chest breathing, you're having a mild or sometimes not even mild flight or fright, fight or flight response, easy for me to say. Uh, or for me, it was a freeze, fight, flight, or freeze. So when I have a few things going on, I just hold my breath. And like, I didn't even notice that until like a couple of years ago. Right. And that, what that does is it just keeps you like this overactive, overstimulated nervous system. And I mean, how do you think your, your inner dialogue is going to be when you're, you know, in that state versus if you're calm, you got the nice big abdomen breaths, you know, five seconds in five seconds out, you're focusing on your breathing dollars to donuts is you're going to have a better, calmer, more creative, uh, you know, inner dialogue, right? So start with the breathing as step zero. Step one is just the awareness of what you're saying to yourself. Now, when I'm thinking of like derogatory self-talk um, and you have a very good point, like it, it definitely comes up when we're talking about the shame and the, it's called, I, I call it like the second arrow. I think it's like a, a Buddhist thing or something along, along those lines where it's like the idea is like, okay, you get in a car accident and then you start shit talking to yourself for getting the car accident, right? You've already hurt yourself You've already done so. Why, why do you feel the need to like shit talk yourself after? So it's the same thing as like you have a relapse. You've already done some damage. Do you really need to start talking shit about yourself? Like, you know what I mean? So that second arrow thing, removing that whole aspect of it as well. So as soon as you can get the awareness, this is where you can start playing with it. So, uh, and this is, these are baby steps. And that's why like everything I do is like these, these little steps that will accumulate over a long enough timeline with consistency. The some of the words that would be the most derogatory is like if somebody says should, is like the should if I don't know should should all over yourself. So if I like I should be doing this, where is that? Who would say that? It would be it would just, like the origin of that is either like your perception of like society is shooting you. It's like a parent, uh, like an authority figure from your past. Like I should be further on in life. Well, who would say that? Cause like, that's not your, tr the true you. That's like your dad saying that to you or whatever. That would be like my dad. Right. Mm -hmm. So just for uh, identifying what word is in there and what every word has, has like some energetic charge to it. Right. So 
if I say like, I should be going outside after this, it feels like judgmental to myself. Even me saying that just, there was an energy to it. Right. So if I, and then if I change it and just go, I could go outside, you can hear the inflection change very different the way it shows up in my body. I could go outside more empowering has a, like a, this uh, idea of choice uh, that changes. And then you can go, I can go outside even more empowering. And then if you add because to it, I can go outside because it's a nice sunny day and I feel like uh, walking the dogs or something like that. You just add that. And all of a sudden it's, it's a completely different sentence and you've completely changed your uh, and edited your, uh, or I've, I've edited myself, my inner dialogue, like in real time. Right. And I feel so much lighter from saying that versus like the should thing, right. It's just dark and it's monotone, it's pressure. So that would be it. Is this um, finding a way to be compassionate on yourself or with yourself um, and just do it one word at a time and just like, it's the awareness and practice it. Right. It, it's not like you're going to have this, uh, this huge uh, 180 overnight. It's, it's one word at a time. And, um, and just, yeah, experiment with it and say it out loud, type it, journal it, uh, and then, you know, reword it to yourself. Uh, a couple other things is quickly, as far as, um, other ways to navigate inner dialogue is, uh, statements of negation. So if you say like, ah, I can't do that. Or like, I'll, I won't ever be able to get to that success level. Very diminishing, right? Um, and the, the way, the way the brain works is if you're speaking with negations, it's still going to focus on that as the truth. Right. So the, uh, the biggest example of that would be like, don't think of the pink elephant. Like you're still thinking of the pink elephant, right? So you got to give your brain, the brain's like a Google search engine. So if you're going to, if you're typing into Google, Google search engine, I can't do this. It's going to bring up articles supporting that. If you type in something, that's going to be a statement of affirmation. Right. Then it's going to be like, I can, what can you do? Well, I can do fill in the blank. Same thing. That'll be in the Google search engine. It's going to find you supportive articles. That's just the way that it works. Right. So just if you're finding that yourself saying these like statements of negation to yourself, the can'ts, the won'ts, just correct that. Okay. Well, don't focus on what you can't do. What can you do? And it's going to shift. It sounds a little bit like, you know, power positive thinking, but this is, it's different. I'm like, there's a, there's a structure to it and there's some reasoning behind it. Right. So, and as soon as you get into that stage where you're, you're talking better to yourself, remember to breathe after, like say a phrase, like I can, you know, fill in the blank. I can blah, blah, blah. And then just breathe it in. So that's the one missing ingredient when people are saying affirmations to themselves and it doesn't stick and you don't feel like you believe it. You're forgetting to breathe and invite it into your body and getting that body mind connection, Right. Whereas like, I mean, I, I used to do power, positive thinking back before I did the certifications and such. And I was, I was like, there was always like a little bit of a skeptic, you know what I mean? Uh, in the back, it's like the heckler at a comedy club. I'd say this affirmation to myself, look myself in the mirror. And there's like this voice in the back of my head, bullshit, you know, like the, the evil, whatever boss or like the, my, you know, whatever. Right. And so that, that surfaces, uh, but when you're breathing and you're allowing it in and you, you, uh, you, uh, you know, connect the body and mind like that, it takes on a whole different thing, the affirmation. So I challenge anybody that's listening to approach it like that. It has to be your own words and you can modify and edit it uh, out of a derogatory inner dialogue into a compassionate and then breathe on it and see what it does. Like your body will really come alive. Like you'll feel it in your body. Uh, Cause honestly, it's probably something that you haven't ever really said or heard, right? You all, like, let's face it. We've heard a collection of don't do this, blah, blah, blah. You know, as we're growing up, that's parenting and it's fine. That's the way, you know, that's the way that, uh, that I was raised is like, you can't do this. Don't go see that person. Stay out of that. It's a lot of negation, uh, uh, accumulation we'll say over a period of time. So walk yourself out of that one word at a time and breathe on it and see what it does. It's yeah, it's, it's amazing. That's awesome. I, I uh, just as I'm listening to you, I need to. I've got a lot better with with kind of my self talk, but uh, uh, just as you're talking, I I could definitely use some uh, some of those tools you just mentioned. So that's yeah. awesome. I like it. Yeah, right on. Thanks. I actually have a. Uh, I'll send you guys this. Um, this is a fun one to do. It's called Soft Talk Challenge. This is another one that we do. I have them up in my office. I've had them up here for a couple of years. So Soft Talk is like guess 
maybe might sort of could think possibly probably hope try one day so that's like if somebody like if you guys invited me over for barbecue and i'm like yeah i guess i might be there like clear you know yeah safe to say i'm not going to be there or i'm going to be late or something like it's that amb ambiguity right and uh honestly like i used to have this in my management style uh because i thought it was like i, I i'd had so many asshole bosses that were like super assertive and blah 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 and i'm like i don't want to be like this guy <laughs> so i would use a uh, soft talk to do like the temper my assertiveness right like i i was like okay if i'm gonna be assertive i'm gonna throw in some like yeah maybe can you get this uh done by like the end of the night you know perhaps like trying especially when i was talking to younger people right i didn't want to like come off like that the asshole boss right um you know now realizing looking back on it it was like i was totally all over the place and that's not what I was going. That was not my intention, uh, but that's how it comes across. So uh, that one has been uh, very much ingrained. I, I do a lot of soft talk and there is time and place for it, right? Like I, I view it in, uh, if you're in like a negotiation of some kind, you're going to pepper that in a little bit just for like respect and again, to temper uh, where you're coming from. Um, but having said that, like if uh, with yourself, like with myself, uh, I try and eliminate the soft talk, right? So if I'm, if I'm, uh, motivated to do something. I'm not going to say in my inner dialogue, yeah, I'll, I'll possibly get that done today. I'm going to be a lot more clear with myself, right? And from being more clear with myself, then I'll be more clear with others around me. And the best way to do this, like if somebody's listening, uh, if you're like a bit of a people pleaser or something like, well, how can I, uh, you know, it's very uncomfortable for you to be th that assertive. Just remember like the best way to do that is be, uh, you know, sort of as conci concise as you can be with manners on the end. So I need you to get that done by the end of the, tonight, please. Right. Throw a please on there at the end. And then you're not going to feel like that, you know, that dick that's always like bah, 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 barking at everyone. Right. So that's the way to do it as well. Um, and the other easy way to monitor yourself with, with soft talk words is uh, through like with your text messages and your emails, they're going to show up the shoulds, the coulds, uh, the possibilities are going to show up in there and just, just edit them out. And then you're going to find, you see in real time, how your sentence just becomes so much more solid. And then you're sending that via text message or something. You're going to feel better about yourself. So that's another little tip as well. Yeah. That reminds me a lot of uh, one of the four agreements. Um, ah, yes. Yes. So, uh, be precise with your words. Yes. Very yeah, good. I, like that. I love that. Yeah. Good call, man. Yeah, absolutely. So Matt, I, uh, I don't have any more questions for you personally, Dave, what about yourself, buddy? I got, I got one for you. It might sound a little off. I don't, or not off, but um, yeah, you know, this, this season we've been doing a lot of, you know, we had someone talking about yoga, uh, Tai Chi, you know, working out. So a lot of like physical um, stuff, you, you know, that you can do for your physical health, which also we now know probably more nowadays than in the past. That's also good for, you know, you mentally. Uh, so I think, I, I think it's safe to say anything you do for your physical self is, is end up being good for your mental health as well. Do you think the same is true, you know, in reverse, like anything we're doing, I know it's a bit of a, maybe a wheel with your, with imbalance, but everything we do for our mental health is, you know, also helps us in our physical being as well. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I love that, man. I've never actually heard anybody like articulate it like that. Excuse me, but yeah, that's, that's great. Honestly, um, you know, part of the program that we did with Lifted was how inner dialogue shows up for like professional athletes, right? So if you imagine yourself going to the gym and just like shit talking yourself, like, you know, the whole like old school, like motivation through like shit talking yourself, right? Is, um, I don't know, I think it's ran its course. This definitely has for me. Right. Where it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, so I love how you're saying that. It's like, that's the entry point. If I'm going to go to the gym now, I'm going to be a lot more supportive and compassionate to myself as if I was working out with my best friend versus, you know, talking down to myself and like trying to motivate myself through like, oh, you was like, bah, bah, bah. yeah. So absolutely, man. I, I feel a lot uh, more just open when I'm at like, yoga or doing something physical or running around the block uh, you know I, if i can cut myself some slack if i'm tired I'll, I'll i'll hold off instead of like trying to rage myself through it you know what i mean and absolutely i'm thinking like my workouts are so much 
better. Uh, there's way less chance of injury because I'm not like goading myself into something I can't do. So yeah, it's a really interesting question. I, uh, I'm glad that you brought that up, to, you know, towards the end here. Absolutely, man. It's, um, you know, it is like one big circle. So if you're going, yeah, just remember that it's actually really worth worthwhile mentioning. You know, I think it's a little bit easier to do with something like yoga. I don't, you know, I've never had a instance where I've like shit talked myself during yoga. You know what I mean? I guess the odd time if I start like wobbling on a foot, I'm like, oh, get it together. Right. But honestly, it's like, I, uh, it's such a positive experience, but definitely when I'm talking like competitive sports or, uh, or going to the gym specifically, I used to very much have that kind of more low vibration, like ah, do it. You gotta, if you're going to get stronger, you got to do this, blah, 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 all that kind of rubbish that like, just, I don't know. Don't, I just don't feel the need to do it anymore. So yeah, really good, really thoughtful question there. I appreciate that. I know. Awesome. Matt. So if someone's listening right now and, uh, they're interested in your recovering coaching services, how do they uh, get in contact with you, man? Yeah. Thanks for the opportunity there. Um, yeah, so it's at recoveryroadmap.me. That is my Instagram handle. I'm on Instagram probably more than I should be. There's the probably soft talk acknowledged. Uh, I'm on there a lot. So if you want to DM me, follow me, I post daily content. Uh, so that is more or less where my business is based out of these days is Instagram. You know, I met you guys through Instagram, meeting a lot of great people through Instagram, the sober uh, recovery community on Instagram. It's just amazing, isn't it? So yeah, at recoveryroadmap.me, that's also my website. So uh, that's easy to remember. And then it's Matt Gardner Live is my YouTube, as well as my Facebook uh, channels. So uh, those would be the two ways to get a hold of me. And like I say, just give me a follow and uh, on Instagram, and that's the easiest way to get a hold of me. Awesome, Matt. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's been an absolute, absolute pleasure. And um, hopefully, uh, hopefully we can help some people today. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you guys so much for having me on. I appreciate the opportunity and thanks to all the listeners and all that. And absolutely. Yeah. Um, let's do it again sometime for sure. Absolutely. Sounds good. Welcome back. Um, it was an absolute honor to have Matt join us and, uh, Dave, I hope you love that episode as much as I did. Yeah. I really, really enjoyed that, uh, that chat with Matt. Well-spoken dude. Um, yeah, I think we could have gone into a lot more, a lot more stuff. So hopefully we'll have them on again uh, sometime. But uh, yeah, hope everyone enjoyed that one for sure. Now, Dave, first question I got for you was prior to entering recovery, did you know about recovery coaches? No, no, I I also did not. So, um, as you. I'll talk about the I'll talk about the bit about this grant that we got type thing, and uh, that's kind of one area that I want to be able to to show people other resources that are available other than say, and don't get me wrong, treatment is incredible. You have the opportunity to go to treatment if you're struggling, hundred percent jump on it. But I also want to show that there are other options available if if you can't type thing. So uh, I don't know. I think recovery coaching is super cool and. Uh, yeah. yeah, that's what I got. I don't know. I don't know where I, I was going with that. No, I think, I, you know, as we're as I was listening to him, um, you know, talking about what he does as a recovery coach, uh, kind of, so I kind of had an idea of what they're all about now. Like now that I'm in recovery, but you know, I've been I was fortunate. I would say that I didn't have a job when I came out of recovery. I mean, fortunate, unfortunate, but I was able to kind of really just focus on recovery and I had time yeah but I think something that a recovery coach is really good for is helping you to create that structure and routine in your recovery uh which if you have a lot if you're juggling a lot of balls like you know uh like you know work family yeah. you know whatever uh I think having someone in your corner like that uh could be very beneficial it's similar to our last episode when we had you know Dave Blaze talking about uh, personal training and create what he does creates uh structure and routine for his clients. Right. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, I think it's something that, you know, potentially, you know, it's something you may need down the road too. Like, even though I'm a little bit into recovery now, let's say I start working full time and all of a sudden I feel kind of stressed with my time management. 
maybe getting a recovery coach um, to help you with that, uh, creating structure could be beneficial, you know? So. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Now um, I'm glad you brought up uh, Dave Blaze and working out. Yeah. Did you like, did you like Matt's comparison between recovery and working out? And uh, has someone made that comparison before? Yes. I, I almost jumped in. I almost jumped in right away and said, uh, I can't believe I didn't say yeah. that the two of you get along, would get along great. Cause uh, yeah, I knew you loved that. Cause I did. I'm like, I'll way, buddy. we're thinking the same thoughts. And not even the way <clears throat> he made the comparison, just the way he explained it after is like mm -hmm. exactly kind of how you've um, said it before. And mm -hmm. uh, I think it's, I think it's a great analogy. So, yeah, I love that part. And uh you know, a personalized recovery plan, that's the thing. Yeah. I don't want to say I'm getting at something here, but I think that's the key to to happiness. A little, uh, you're walking and you're picking stuff and putting it in your own basket for your recovery. Yeah, it's and it's just like, just like working out how it's a, a journey, let's say, and you might change kind of. Adjust. Your focus. Yeah, adjust depending on where you're at, and and yeah. like you know, the last episode, Blaze talking about maybe you run a marathon and then you decide you want to do something else. I mean, you're gonna have recovery, different different things are gonna happen in your life where you gotta adjust that bad boy. Exactly, you're always gonna have that base of focus on your recovery first, obviously, but mm -hmm. maybe what you're adding to it, um, you know, like maybe early on in recovery, it's it's heavy, heavy recovery tool focus recovery focus meetings like things like that and then as you progress you still have those but maybe you only need to do them two three times a week and you can add in other elements and then maybe you go through a tough time where you need to go back to doing everyday meetings you know so yeah I think it's an ongoing journey couldn't agree more well yeah so i love that uh, that got me fired right up i uh, i have a question for you from all ears what did you like most about the the end the end component talking about uh negative self talk and uh those kind of that kind of topic? Oh. Um that's a great question. And I don't want to let me okay, yeah. I liked all that because I don't know as as you struggle with addiction, that negative self talk and inner what does he refer to it as? He refers to it as his inner dialogue. That becomes overwhelming. And how we talk to ourselves gets just some gets pretty dark there sometimes. Um and I think my main takeaway is just like being mindful of being mindful of that and and talking to yourself a bit more kind. I don't know if that makes sense, but uh, I know what I think I know what you liked about it. And I liked, was it the uh, soft words? Is that what he referred to it as? Yeah. Yeah. Is that so, your favorite part of it? Yeah. I like that. And the shooting all over yourself. Oh, shooting. shooting yes. Off. That was really good. Yeah. 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 Yeah, Jared used a soft word to us when he said he was going to make make it to this. He said he'll probably probably be able to make it to uh, well, shooting the sober shit. Yeah, you picked up on that, eh? I did. I and I only did too because we like we had just finished recording. Yeah, uh, me too. And as soon as he said probably, I'm like, yeah, he's not making it. Yeah, we'll see uh, though. We'll see, Jared. And that made me laugh. So yeah, we got to talk. I think being mindful of your words and uh, like I kind of mentioned about the four agreements. Um, that's one of my favorite agreements and I'm not really following it right now. Cause I'm kind of babbling, but uh, no, no. Yeah, man. I, I love that bit. That was sweet. Yeah. Yeah. I liked, um, liked it as well. I think, I think no matter how far along in recovery you are, or even if you're not in recovery, like focus on that 
like, you know, the shitting all over yourself. You know, he talked about, you know, I should go for a walk. It makes it sound like it's kind of a, a task oh, that yeah. you and like, mm-hmm. um, you know, it's not, it's not a positive thing. I'm just saying like, I can go for a walk, whatever. Yeah. I, uh, uh I should all over myself all the time. Do you? Yeah. yeah I think, I think I do. I think yeah. I do should, should all over myself. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. I'm a big, big shudder. Yeah. Just this morning, I'm like, I should, I should be doing this, should be doing that, should be. And sometimes you, you when you say you don't, you're not really like, like think like I when I say it, it's not like I'm in a negative headspace necessarily or like down about it. But I think if you do that enough, it will mm-hmm. turn negative, right? That, you Absolutely. know what I mean. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Dave, I had yeah. one more thing to talk about on the episode. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I think you asked an incredible question. Well, thank you. It was about, so how a lot of times we talk about how physical exercise and stuff like that is beneficial for our mental health. Yes. But we also, you, we don't ever reverse that. And that was such a great question because it's so important that like when my mental health's not good type thing, I'm not, I'm not being physically active. It's kind of inverse type thing where like, I don't have the motivation. I'm not as healthy as I want to be. And they kind of, they go hand in hand. And I, I think that's what you're getting at. Yeah, it definitely was. I, I, I was happy with how it came out. Yeah. Um, because I didn't know that it was going to come out very well at all when I started. Cause I wasn't really sure uh, on how I want on how I was going to say it, but yeah, yeah the fact you kind of you got it, um, yeah, that's exactly exactly it. I just kind of had that thought thought because like you know, as someone that's even like how much I've been trying to focus on the gym like myself, let's say, <laughs> and you can always sit there and be like, well, I know it's just physically good for me. I'm going to the gym, and I know it's going to be mentally good for me, so that's you know that's great, but you know, you should also be making time for that mental health as well. Mm-hmm. And if you're someone that's like, well, I don't necessarily have the time. I only have time for the, you know, for the gym. I don't have time for that. Well, knowing that that will help you with your physical self as well can maybe make you find time for it. If that makes any sense. Maybe I should have just stuck with what I said earlier. No, it was banger. Yeah. So, yeah. Be kind. And speak to yourself kind. Yes. Anyway, dude, that's all I got, man. I it was an absolute pleasure to have him on. Um, hopefully we get him on again. Um, maybe in maybe in season three we'll bring him back. Yeah. Yeah, it was a perfect uh it was a perfect episode, I thought, to like kind of tied in all the stuff we've been doing in season two and um ties it into recovery all kind of in a nice little bow should yeah it does all right guys if you or someone you know is struggling please reach out and ask for help thank you so much for listening